What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Fish Bites, the Miami Herald's Miami Marlins podcast. I'm your host, Andre Fernandez, Deputy Sports Editor. Back after a brief hiatus with Miami Marlins beat writer Jordan McPherson. We were off a couple of weeks, and uh, a lot's happened since. Before we get to all that Marlins news that's kept Jordan busy, even though Jordan was supposed to kind of maybe exhale in the offseason. Of course, that doesn't happen because the Marlins are Never changing happens. GMs. The, the, of course, the Herald is sending them to cover the Florida Panthers every other day. Or every day, pretty much, even if it's from home. But how about those Texas Rangers? I mean, I had a feeling about, I remember I said on this last episode, I had a feeling about those Rangers, and boy, did they ever. I mean, not just, you know, even losing Adolis Gar- Garcia down at the near the finish line, and after a playoff run that really, I, I thought Randy Arosarena last year didn't have a playoff run that we'd never see again. <laughs> Think twice. This, this kid definitely had one. And Corey Seager winning MVP. What'd you think of the World Series? Yeah, no, it was a fun World Series. I mean, kind of inevitable that it was going to be uh, Texas and Arizona when I predicted it was going to be Houston Philly. So just every <laughs> anytime I make a prediction on this podcast, race get anywhere else, just do the exact opposite of what I of what I predict. But yeah, no, Texas incredible year. I mean, watch when I watched them in Arlington when the Marlins went out there and they just laid the hammer out on the Marlins. I basically said. If this offense does rem- does two thirds of what they did against Miami the rest of the season, they're gonna they're gonna be a contender, and they were the example. Unlike the Mets, unlike the Padres, unlike those other teams that spent and got nowhere, they were the example of if you spend wisely and you make the right moves, things will things will work out in your favor. Obviously, again, getting Corey Seager and Marcus Semien a couple years ago. Uh, the trade for Max Scherzer, Adolis Garcia's breakout, they uh, Nathan Eovaldi becoming the playoff stud on the mound. Just everything worked for them as they got into the postseason. Kudos to them. Kudos to them getting that first World Series. And yeah, and now we're at the offseason, which really for on the Marlins front, there's basically it's felt like there's been news ever since they got eliminated beginning of October. It's been a was yeah. a busy October. It's already turned to a busy start of November, which will bleed into winter meetings going into next month. But we have a lot to talk about today, Andre, don't we? Yeah, definitely do. I mean, starting at the top, I mean, let's go right to it. You know, no more Kim Ang. We know we found that out a, a while back. Uh, she has uh, left the Marlins, and uh, we wish her well. Hope to see if she lands somewhere else. But uh, Peter Bendix, the big, uh, the big news, new GM for the Marlins. From the Tampa Bay Rays, a lot of experience there and uh, turning that, you know, continuing the the fine work that the Rays have done over the years and continuing to be a playoff contender consistently. Who is Peter Bendix, Jordan, and can he bring some of that winning magic to this team that, you know, finally broke through, took the big step we always been talking about of making the playoffs, but now can they take the next step after that and become a true title contender? What does Peter bring? Yeah, well, first off, he's going to be the president of baseball operations, not GM. They are he is president of baseball ops. They're potentially going to add a GM in addition to that. They won the two tier system again. But okay. Peter, but Peter Bendix, so he's got the, Michael Hill. He's got Michael Hill's old job. Basically. Yeah, correct. He has Michael Hill's old title, and they're going go. to. That was the whole plan with Bruce Sherman. He wanted to hire a president of baseball operations over Kim Ang, have her stay in the GM title, and have basically the two-person system on in addition yeah. to the AGMs, yada, yada, yada. Glad, glad but, you made that distinction because I think a lot of people think they're one and the same all the time, and they're, yeah. and they're not. So. Yeah, no, so uh, Peter Bendix, he's been with, he was with the Rays for 15 years, started as an intern in 2009, worked his way all the way up to getting the GM job ahead of the 2022 season. He was the number two. He's been the number two in the Rays' work for the last few years under Eric Neander, who – was their pre- who is their president of baseball operations, but ne- uh, uh, Bendix, he basically touched a little bit of everything in the Rays org, did a lot on the development and analytics side, which are two key areas that the Marlins are trying to improve on. Their de- player development has been very underwhelming, to say the least, under this ownership group. Uh, their drafting has been very underwhelming. Analytics has been hit or miss, on uh, personal opinion, has been more miss than hit. So to have a guy with those experiences and those strengths is was a key. And also, when you think about it with the Marlins, for years, I mean, ever since at least since I've been on the beat, they've always been like, "Yeah, we want to be, we want to be where the Rays are. We want to be that team that, despite not having the highest payroll, despite not having all the resources, 
can figure out how to consistently be a playoff team, and not just playoff team, a team that can make playoff runs. I mean, the Rays made the World Series in that COVID short in 2020 season. They made the playoffs each of the last five years. Division titles, two of those five years, three division titles overall in the 15 years that Bendix has been there. And if you can't become the Rays by yourselves, why not go out and get one of the guys who's been among those main decision makers and help that he can be the number one here? So logically, on paper, all the move makes sense. Now it's a matter of seeing what he's able to do here, what what he does as the overall decision maker, not not the number two. That's going to be the main thing to see over this next month, and and also figuring out how he's able to fill a lot of the holes that are left. Again, the Marlins, they have to find a new person to lead amateur scouting and draft after they let DJ Spillett go. Their head of international operations is open after Adrian Lorenzo left at the end of the season. So he already has those two spots to fill. And yeah, and he also, again, he has to learn an entire new organization and figure out how to improve it simultaneously. And he has, it's November now, spring trains in February. You've got about three, four months to make it happen. Yeah, it, it, not a lot of time. They got to get hit the ground running and come in and really fill these spots and, and see if they can address those areas that they were a little lacking in and, and really uh, familiarize yourself because we saw, you know, when someone else comes in, especially a person of this, you, you, you bring your own ideas, your own styles, and everything kind of has to mesh. And that process can take a little bit of time too. So it's an interesting off season for a team that made broke through to the postseason, And right now it's kind of in that in between, like, do they continue to move forward and become, get a little closer to truly contending? You don't want to slip back to what you were. And the Marlins are kind of, playing that fine line right now. But you made that distinction about the GM job, the president of baseball operations job. So who will be the next GM? I mean, I think your hunch we were talking about was that maybe one of those three assistant GMs maybe gets promoted. I mean, I, I can't see it being too much of a committee. It, it's got to be some, if not one singular voice, there's got to be a little more of that maybe going on here. But who you think has the inside track? Yeah, so from where it stands, I mean, I feel like if they brought in an outside general manager and then they had the three agms that they have having five people making those decisions it feels like it feels like too many cooks in the kitchen so, so to speak right and the way that bruce sherman originally wanted to line this up was the gm handles the 40-man roster handles the major league decisions the and then the president of baseball operations bendix in this this in this instance has the more overarching look at the entire baseball operations from the very top all the way down to everything down with low way and how player development moves on and the acquisition processes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're going to have your GM be someone who's looking at the roster, looking at roster construction and things of that nature, it would make sense for a guy like a Brian Chadden who's been here forever, who precedes this ownership group and is one of the few guys who actually has been here from the, from the, before this gecko, before this whole thing started, he would make sense if Bendix wants to go more of the analytics side, since that's really where his forte is. That would lean towards Dan Greenlee. Uh, Ozzo Campo is the third of the AGMs, just came on with the Marlins last year after being with uh, with the Houston Astros for a good bit of time. Uh, I mean, any of the three you can make a case for, but I would think it would be either Chad or Greenlee if it's one of the internal guys. And again, again, for me, that just goes back to also have the fact that if you have one of those two do it, especially Greenlee and Chan, who have been here for a while, it gives Bendix the, the right-hand man of somebody who has the understanding of the organization, of where things stand, and has that institutional knowledge that will be able to hopefully lessen that learning curve early on in his, early on in his reign as he tries to get as much of a quick start as he can this offseason. How about on the amateur scouting side, you know, you mentioned that before, just, you know, replacing an Adrian Lorenzo and DJ Svillick, who had so much input into the draft day part of it. Who comes in there? Who can they get to, to, you know, make that stronger? I guess you should say, I mean, they've had, like you said, it's been a little hit or miss. They have landed a few guys and every, there's always misses with any team, but you felt like, especially on the drafting side, some of the bigger, we saw a lot of former first round picks go out the door and didn't work out. So who do they get there to kind of strengthen that department? Yeah, that's the interesting part. I don't really have much insight on where they're going with that yet. That's why I'm waiting until 
next week when we find when we formally get to talk with Pierre Bendix about what his direction is for both of those departments for amateur scouting and international operations. But the cut and drive it is the Marlins drafting needs to be better and their player development once they get drafted needs to be better, especially on the position player side. I mean, since the Marlins, since this ownership group took over, the Marlins only have one position player that they've drafted over these six years that is on that was on their big league roster for that playoff run. That was catcher Nick Fortes. They have a couple of their pitchers who made it in, who they drafted in this group that has made it in or that they scouted from the international side. Obviously, Yuri Perez, he was injured, but he was one of the guys who they got during this during this regime. Uh, Brian Hoeing was was one of their guys. Andrew Nardi, who became a sensation in the back of the bullpen, was one of their draftees. Max Meyer, who was injured last year, another option. But if you look at it, they've had six drafts, six first-round picks. Three of them, the Marlins traded away in order to bolster the roster. They traded away Connor Scott, the first draft pick, the first first round pick that they've had in for the Jacob in the Jacob Stallings deal. JJ Blade traded in the AJ Puck deal, and then Khalil Watson drafted two years ago, traded for for the Josh Bell deal at the trade deadline. And then your other three: you have Max Meyer, who was hurt last year, and then you have Jacob Berry and Noble Meyer, who were your two most recent guys. Jacob Berry in Double A this year, Noble Meyer, high school guy drafted this year, obviously. Can't really make any sort of assessment on him after he's only pitched about like, what not even ten innings in the in pro ball yet. But to see that three of your three of your first four guys essentially that you drafted in the first round were traded because either you felt like it was going to be a ways away or that you weren't going to see the end goal with them. To see that massive hit rate and that massive just disconnect with your top guys that raises flags. And that shows that they needed a change there. And then the international operations side, again, outside of Yuri Perez, they really haven't had a guy who's broken through yet. Obviously, you know what happened at the start when they signed the Mesa brothers. Victor Jr., I still have hopes for, but obviously Victor Victor, that seems to have all but flamed out. They have a couple guys who seem to be making some strides, Yiddy Cape specifically, but he still hasn't made it to the upper minors, and it's been, I believe, we're going on to year four with him. Uh they trade Jose Salas as part of the Pablo, as part of the Luis Arias trade, which obviously that one made sense considering you got a batting champ. But there's the homegrown position players have been very minimal, and that's that's definitely concerning for a team that, especially with their budget and where their payroll usually stands, right. they need to be able to get that homegrown success in order to have sustainability. Kim Ang did a great job of fixing the holes where she could, but. There are only some. There's only so much more that you could do on that front once you trade the farm away. Yeah, and you have to have a base for those moves to to kind of work. Because a lot of them exactly. are complementary moves that paid off, but they're not foundational players. You need, you know, you can't always be. You know, you're not going to go out and pay 100 million for someone not with this budget, not with this payroll. So, um, speaking of some of those monetary decisions, they have started to make over the course of the past few weeks. Uh, just recently, Jorge Soler, they declined, you know, declined the player option there. But uh, Josh Bell's coming back and John Birdie, Matt Barnes out the door and Johnny Cueto. Not a big surprise on either of those guys. But that's some of the some of the moves that have been made so far. What do you think of just the way that's kind of shaping up? I think Soler was the one we were kind of waiting to see yeah. uh, mainly. I mean, Bell, too. But I think Soler, we wanted to see how that would yeah. turn out. Yeah, no, it was more Bell than Soler. Everything else was basically when it's planned. I didn't expect Soler to enact his player option. He made, okay. 15, he made 15 million this year, hit 36 home runs. And then to come back for 13 million wasn't I didn't. I thought he was going to try to test the market. I was interested to see if the Marlins were going to put a qualifying offer on him, though. To right. see that if he opted, if he chose not to do that, then they at least get draft pick compensation. But when you think about it, the qualifying offers was a hair was about twenty point three million. Would the Marlins want to risk Solaire coming back for twenty point three million when they when he wasn't gonna, when they just paid him fifteen last year, or did they want to potentially that money spread elsewhere to be able to fix some of their other holes? Since they do have a few other holes, power in the lineup is obviously a big spot, but they have a few spots where they need to fill. Josh Bell coming back is a plus. Is a, I don't want to say it's a surprise, but I felt like that was the biggest toss up out of all these player and team options that were out there. It was a $16.5 million option. He had a great two months with the Marlins. I think it was about an 818 OPS, 11 home runs after really struggling the first half of the season in Cleveland. But again, he's a Scott Boris guy. 
He's so I thought that if Boris thought there was maybe an inkling that he could get 16.501 on the open market, he would say, Hey, Josh, try to let's see what we can get here. But Josh Bell coming back that solidifies first base, their starting first base spot for them, gives them both of their corners are set with Jake Berger being back at third base. Luis Rise at second. You have three of your main four infield spots locked in. So Bell coming back is great, especially since when you think about it, Yuli Gurriel is gone. So if they lost both Yuli and Josh Bell, and they would basically, they would have to be starting completely from scratch at first base. So to be able to know that they at least have Josh Bell there, and now they really just have to worry about the backup first base spot, which we'll talk about that in a little bit with some of the potential prospects who could potentially be coming up next season. Bell coming back is a big boost, both from what he gives you at first base, a switch hitter who can hit, hit for power from both sides, and just the veteran presence he brought in over those two months. As soon as he got traded, he was basically became a vocal guy in those in the hitters' meetings, in the batting cages. He is the guy who you can lean on in that clubhouse to be able to build around this team. And then the other options, then the team exercising their club option on John Birdie, that was a no-brainer. It's only yeah, $3.6 $3. million for what Birdie provides them. The speed, the, the defensive utility, hit three, he hit 294 last season. So the stolen bases were down, but he was able to hit. He ended up playing a lot of shortstop down the stretch once Joey Wendell went on the downswing. So he gives you, again, he gives you depth at second base, shortstop, third base, can play all three outfield spots. So he gives you your options, even if he's not an everyday starter at one specific spot. And then the other two guys, Johnny Cueto, we all knew that wasn't he wasn't coming back. It was a, a $10.5 right. million dollar team option, $2.5 million buyout. You eat the $2.5 million. Matt right. Barnes, Matt Barnes, it was $8 million and $2.25 million for the buyout. Obviously, when they traded for him, their goal was they needed a high leverage righty, especially with Anthony Bender out with Tommy John last year. Barnes struggled when he did pitch and then was out the entire second half of the season after undergoing hip surgery. You have Anthony Bender coming back. George Soriano took a big step forward. You have JT Chargois. So you have three high leverage righties already who are cheaper. The three of them combined are going to be making less than half of what Matt Barnes would have made with that $8 million. So you have those three. You could probably find another you find another cheap right-handed reliever on, on the open market in free agency or swing a trade for one. So to cut Matt Barnes and cut Johnny Cueto, those two were absolute no-brainers. Yeah, for sure. And um, now I think, well, now when you look at the calendar, uh, now obviously the season's over and now everything kicks into motion. The next few big dates coming up for the Marlins are going to be November 14th, and that's the deadline to protect the Rule 5 guys, which uh, includes guys like Troy Johnston, Victor Mesa Jr., Nassim Nunez, Will Banfield, longtime uh, Marlins uh, farm man. No, Will Banfield, who gets protected, who doesn't? Any uh, some there are probably no brainers, but uh, who do you, what do you think uh, about that front? What do you think the Marlins do there? Yeah, so I mean, the Marlins have about eight or nine guys total. Those four you mentioned are have to be their priority. Troy Johnston, left handed hitting first baseman, was their minor league MVP. Had hit, I think it was like 119 RBI, had 20 stolen bases as a first baseman. He, I feel like, unless they go out and sign a backup first baseman, I think he's going to. If he's not in the opening day roster, he's going to be one of the first guys up. He had, again, a lefty bat who can hit for power, hit for average, and gives you a pretty and play some pretty good defense out there. And he's definitely he's been on the, the rise the last two years. He definitely makes the most sense there. I would protect Victor Mason Jr. and Will Banfield just for the sense of we know where the Marlins catching depth is. And by that, I mean there really isn't much. And if Will Bamfield is going to potentially be one of your guys in the future, him and Paul McIntosh are their two guys, you need you more than likely need to protect. I feel like you protect him and see where you go from there. Victor makes your juniors a toss-up. He hasn't gone above double A, but Marlins really don't have center field depth as well. If a team decided, hey, we want to take a chance, we can take the guy and just stash him as our fourth outfielder, he's definitely an option if someone wanted to take him to roll five draft that way. And the same score goes in the Nassim Nunez. I mean, he, don't, he still hasn't gone above double A, but his defense is up there, and he's probably second in line in the Marlins shortstop department in the minor leagues just behind Jacob Amaya. But of them, Troy will be a no-brainer. The next Mesa Jr. and Nassim Nunez and Will Banfield would be my second in line to protect. And then if there's one other from this group, I would probably think it'd be Anthony Maldonado. He's 
one of their uh, relief pitchers who did really well up in AAA and could potentially be one of the first guys up out of that out of that minor league group, him and Josh Simpson of among the Marlins pitching prospects, relief pitcher prospects who haven't debuted yet are probably in that pecking order. Maldonado actually pitched for Puerto Rico in the World Baseball Classic last year. But yeah, Troy Johnson's definitely the main guy. And then Nunez, Mesa, Mesa Jr. and Banfield are guys I'm keeping my eye on as we get as we get closer to that next week. Yeah, and Mesa Jr. finally uh, making a lot of strides this past season too. So let's see, you know, it would be good maybe to keep him. It's like you said, especially for that depth there that they're not very, they don't have a lot of options there. Uh, then the no- November 17th is the non-tender deadline, which uh, Martins have a lot of guys up for ARB. I mean, most of them probably will come back though. I mean, you know, Lisa Rye is of course 10.8 million. Jesus Lazardo 5.9. Tanner Scott, 5.8. Jacob Stallings, 3.6. I pause there. We'll get we'll get back to that. But uh, Jazz Chisholm, 2.8. Jesus Sanchez, A.J. Puck, Trevor Rogers, Garrett Hampson, Stephen Oker, J.T. Chargois, Anthony Bender. All those guys. The one that sticks out, and that's why you did the little <laughs> noise right now. They're probably they're not keeping Jacob Stallings. And uh, the money is only one reason. Isn't that, isn't that right, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, catcher, we all know that that and short are the two areas the Marlins need to improve. There's just there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, considering, well, they don't have a true shortstop right now. So unless you go with the birdie Hampson platoon, which those two are better suited for utility roles where you bring Jacob Amaya up, and I don't think his bat's ready. So they need a shortstop. Catcher, I'll just say this. Jacob Stallings, these last two years, his one of his main roles was being able to be that guy for the Marlins ace Sandy Alcantara. He caught every single one of his pitches over these past two seasons, helped him win the Cy Young in 2022, helped him navigate through a struggling start to the 2023 season, and helped him sort of rebound toward the back half of the season. But Sandy Alcantara is not pitching in 2024. He underwent right. Tommy John surgery at the end of last season. So if there's a chance to, if there is a reason to justify moving on from Jacob Stallings at this point and either A, give Nick Fortes the chance to become a number one catcher or try to find another guy to be your number one catcher, this would probably be the time. And I will say with Nick Fortes, he was the main guy for both Jesus Lazardo and Braxton Garrett, who were the Marlins number one and number twos in the playoffs. So, right. If you're going to have a chance to have Nick Fortes be number one, it may as well be when his two guys are going to be two of the top three guys in that rotation next year, along with Yuri Perez. So, right. as again, Jacob Stallings, not saying anything bad, bad about the dude. He was fantastic in that clubhouse for two years. He came up with a few big, big moments during his two years with the Marlins. He gave them, in a sense, what they wanted on that defensive side, especially with Sandy. But... Can you justify three point six million for him to not be the guaranteed number one starting catcher? I don't think they can. No, it just doesn't seem. It's time. It's like what you said. All the reasons you just said. It's time, and Sandy can get used to someone else in twenty twenty five when he's back and healthy. Knock on wood. Um, but big decisions coming um, beyond the non tender deadline. Of course, what the Martins can get. Let's fast forward to December now, December 4th through the 7th, the winter meetings. Always an interesting time for all of baseball. And uh, this year they're in Nashville, Tennessee, one of my favorite places in the Same country. Here. You're, so, you're so lucky. I wish I could tag along. Uh, maybe I should. Maybe I'll stow away on a plane with you and get that. Yeah, right. Listen to oh, me. That's I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, you're I'm, still I'm, open, Andre. You still, yeah, you still yeah, a I should. Up, add your credential in there. If you, if you need, if you, if, you know. I mean, for old times' sake, we should team up. I mean, heck, it's right before the state football playoffs. I can hop, get a get a flight from Nashville over to Tallahassee pretty easy, I'm sure. So, but anyway, let's see what happens. A lot of interesting questions with that Marlins. I mean, the needs, of course, like you said, power in the lineup. You know, maybe a full year of Jake Berger and Josh Bell. <laughs> can <laughs> Jazz Chisholm stay on the field? Remains to be seen. That would be nice. I mean, at this point, I think we'll take two thirds of a season at this point. Um, you know, but overall, they need to they need to address it somehow. Even if it's kind of similar moves to what they did last year, they need to get a shortstop and catcher, as you said before, and figure out the plan. No Sandy in 2024, but there is Yuri, there is Lazardo, more than likely. How do they sort that part out? 
you know, a lot of questions. So um, what do you most, I guess, uh, Nashville aside, on the baseball side, what do you what are you expecting at the winter meetings? Yeah, so beyond my trip to the Grand Old Opry before everything starts up, <laughs> again, the winter meetings, the hotel is right next, is the, the yeah, Grand Old right Opry there. right next to it. Yeah, so we're going to be right there, and that first day is always mellow. So, but again, with the Marlins, it's always, it seems like their winter meetings are normally just gauging everything. The winter meetings themselves is normally the big wigs, the teams with the high payrolls making all the big the big moves, and then and the Marlins basically trying to lay the foundation for whether it's trades to set up to set up in the long run down the stretch, or at least just laying the foundation for that second tier of free agents. That's just generally seems to be the thing because just with the Marlins and what they do with the payroll, they never they're never going to go for the top targets. I'm hate to break it to all you. I don't think the Marlins are going to be in the Shohei Otani sweepstakes as much as I would love for that to happen. Wait, what? Yeah. Oh. I don't think they're yeah. going to be in the Aaron Nola sweepstakes. They missed their chance last year to get the Cody Bellinger redemption project. But yes, there they are did. but there are some names that could make sense for them. I mean, if you look at shortstop, the main name out there as of right now on the free agent market, barring what we see with non-tender deadline and things like that, Tim Anderson seems to be the main guy out there at shortstop for free agent. Catcher market's thin. Mitch Garver could make some sense, even though he's primarily been a DH more than a catcher. So this is probably this is a rough time for the Marlins to be needing those two spots. Trading may be their best route to get specifically on the catcher side. But again, they need to find some power. Jorge Soler had 36 of their 116 or so home runs. He had more than 20% of their home runs. But they only had Bell and Berger for two months of that. Berger, we saw, has 30 home run potential himself. Bell, when he's hot, he can get he can be a 25 home run guy. Jazz. We could see, has that twenty home run potential if there's a hundred if he can hit the hundred game mark, uh, but they have they have some pieces in there where they can make things work, but they need to lengthen out that lineup beyond Burger Bell Jazz Arise. They need at least one or two more guys, whether that's Jesus Sanchez or Brian De La Cruz taking another step forward, or ideally getting another guy to rotate in there with them to get that 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 five through seven spot in the lineup a little bit deeper. And then with the pitching plan, again, Lazardo, Braxton Garrett, and Yuri Perez seem to be the one through three. I'm intrigued to see what they do with Edward Cabrera. He's out of minor league options. We know when he's at his best, he can be a frontline guy. But those, com but that command, he still hasn't consistently figured it out. And are they going to have him on the roster and have him be their four or five? Or do they use him to flip and to flip in in a trade to try to get something from something out, something out there to help with the lineup, because beyond him, you have Trevor Rogers coming back. You have Ryan Weathers, who they got from the Padres, who the Marlins are hoping is similar to a Haze, the Hazers Lozardo reclamation project they made they did a few years ago. We saw that work with Lozardo. You have Max Meyer coming back from Tommy John surgery, so you have him in the mix as well. And then there's the we will finally be getting our answer on Sixto Sanchez this year. He is out of minor league options. They have to, one way or the other, decide what they're doing with him. And honestly, with a brand new regime in the president of, in the baseball operations department, this might finally be the time where they finally just snip, cut snip, ties. cut the cord there. Yep. I think they're cutting ties. I, I, I'd be shocked. I mean, it, it better be some. It, it, the problem is he can't stay healthy. Yeah. And if he can't, uh, this team, I don't think you're right. When there's a regime change like this, I don't think they're going to be that patient with them. You know, then we even before this, we saw them cutting a lot of ties with past quote unquote, I guess you say past mistakes that they've mm -hmm. made. They're both in trades and draft picks and that sort of thing. So I don't think there's no reason to think six though will suddenly get some kind of special treatment just because. So no, I think it's, I think it is time, but, uh, it's time for that. It's kind of time for this episode, but it's been fun being back, uh, you know, bringing fish bites back to you after a little bit of a playoff rest. Um, we'll be coming to you throughout this off season, whenever there's uh, happenings with the Marlins. I'm sure Jordan will be uh, more than excited to share his uh, experience in Nashville. And maybe we could do like a winter meetings episode before and after. And, yeah. Uh, I was uh, definitely thinking at minimum, a preview, a preview and recap. And yeah, so again, we'll definitely have at least one more at the end of the month to 
get to get the gauge for winter meetings. And then we'll do the recap for what they do or don't do at that point. Uh, before we end this episode, just two quick things. Quick shout out to Marlins manager, Skip Schumacher, one of three finalists for NL manager of the year. It's him, yeah. Craig Council, and Brian Snicker. Craig Council getting it for what he did with the Milwaukee Brewers, not preemptively what he's going to do with the Chicago Cubs, getting <laughs> higher, getting that higher getting announced right before the award show. And then right. also uh, Silver Sluggers. Luis Arias and Jorge Soler are both finalists. Those awards get announced on Thursday. I don't see any way that Luis Arias does not win, considering he was the batting champ. And, but Jorge <laughs> Soler won a four finalists on the DH side. That could go either way. J.D. Martinez is obviously an option there. Bryce Harper is one of the other guys. So you have pretty sack feel for the NL DH. But those get announced Thursday. The NL Manager of the Year award gets announced uh, Tuesday, November 14th on MLB Network. I feel like Skip Schumacher just, again, this may just be me being around him all year, but I feel like based off of the group that's there, I feel like Skip has to be the front runner to win it, considering everyone was expecting the Braves to do what they did. And Craig Council, as great as he's been, as steady as he's been, the Brewers were expected to make the playoffs as well. The Marlins were, as we all know, and as we predicted ourselves, we thought they were going to be fourth in the division. We thought they would be at best a 500 team if everything went right. They made it into the playoffs. They were the number two wild card seed. Yes, they got swept by Philly, but their regular season accomplishment, which is what the awards look at, I feel like what Skip was able to do with this team, it just it it makes the most logical sense that he would get that. Obviously, we don't know the re the results yet, but it just my my two cents are with what he did this year. It would make sense for him to be the winner, and if he is, he would be the fourth Marlins manager to get the NL Manager of the Year award. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the way they made it too, I mean, look at all the, the close games, the injuries they, they dealt with, things like that, you know, all kinds of adversity and they're still able to do it. I agree with you. I mean, if you look at, especially looking at who the final three are, yeah, no, it's, I, it's it doesn't always turn out the way you would, you would expect, but I would think that this time, I think the voters knew ahead of time that, that these Marlins were, a surprise story to say the least. And uh, Skip was a big reason for that. So I, I think, I think it'll turn out his way, hopefully, but uh, we'll share that with you in the coming weeks and everything else. And we'll bring you, and of course, if anything big happens with the team between now and then Jordan will uh, have it covered at Miami Herald.com. Uh, follow his stories and everything else that he does for the Herald, uh, both on the Marlins front, the Panthers and high school sports, which I'm dragging him to a little bit now as we are, in the football playoffs but uh for fish bites uh we can say we'll be back in the coming weeks and definitely before the winter meetings at the end of the month uh we'll probably have an episode previewing that so for jordan mcpherson i'm andre fernandez thanks for joining us once again on the fish bites miami herald podcast